Imaginaries. Hello there, and welcome to the Imaginaries podcast. I'm the disco ball with an entire civilization trapped inside, but which shows you only the reflection of you who will never be their savior, Tony. <laughs> well, I'm the cop car you pulled over for on the highway, only to realize he pulled over someone else at least a half mile back, and now you just look like a dumbass parked on the side of the highway. Kend. Oh. <laughs> that, that feels like maybe a personal experience. That is actually a personal experience. Uh, I thought Thank so. Well, much. it encapsulates you then. <laughs> um, and welcome to today's episode of The Imaginaries, uh, in which we are going to talk about the gays. The gays. And by that I mean the G-A-Y-S, not the G-A-Z-E. Which, like, we'll probably have we'll a We'll probably podcast. get to that someday. Yeah, I was going to say, we'll yeah. have, like, a podcast about the male gaze and <laughs> in science and fiction, fantasy, female and gaze and, and all the gazing. And the, yeah, Ooh, all the like, gazing. all the gazing in Twilight. You know how there's, oh, like, a uh, super smash cut of all of the stares in Twilight on YouTube somewhere? It I, lasts, like, hours. I was going to say, I don't have those hours in the day to devote <laughs> to that. But anyway, no, we're not talking about gazing today. We are talking about the gaze. Oh, darn. So... Uh, You may have noticed, if you have browsed our backlist, or if you've been with us for a while, that we actually have an episode on queering science fiction and fantasy, um, and also kind of a little bit about queers in science fiction and fantasy. However, this episode is not that episode. So, I want to, right at the outset, tell you what we're going to do with this episode. Oh, thank God. Go ahead. So, uh, it's not about queering science fiction and fantasy, so kind of like changing things around, changing up the game. It also isn't about all of the identities that that exist under the fabulous LBGTQ plus uh, identity flag. We will have future podcasts devoted to trans folks in science fiction and fantasy, devoted to ace folks in science fiction and Mm -hmm. fantasy. However, what today's podcast is about is... The gays. The gays. <laughs> the actual uh, or, like the actual gays. Right, right. So we're defining this as characters and authors from minority sexual orientations who have same-sex oriented romantic and or sexual attractions. Indeed. Mm-hmm. And we're not even going to touch that whole toxic conversation about policing the genders. Mm-hmm. If you subscribe to an identity, you are that identity. We're just going to roll with that for this podcast. Mm-hmm. And we're also, not to engage in any bisexual eraser, but we're going to bring up some bisexuals as well. Um, hopefully we'll give the bisexuals their episode in the future. However, this for this episode, we're just going to consider any character, any author, who has any same-sex uh, attraction um, to be a fair subject for this podcast, even if that attraction is not their sole attraction. Indeed. And we will point this out as we go through some of our example texts. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about intersectionality, and uh, that's going to be a major component of this podcast as well. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yes, bisexuals, we love you. You are here. Mm-hmm. You are represented. And you will yeah. also get further conversation in future podcasts. Totally. Um, so, maybe just to, you know, as soon as we give that clear definition of what we're doing maybe we can muddy the waters a little bit so we just we just had a quick conversation about a book that we both really liked that came out this year 2018 Mm -hmm. uh starless by jacqueline carey so good so good so good um but how two of the major characters from that book kind of muddy the waters about who what books what characters what authors we might be considering as part of this podcast and if you are allergic to spoilers here's a moment (laughs) where you may want to clap your hands over your ears and go no 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 for a minute because when it comes to starless i feel like it's important that we explain a little bit of the background of what's happening here so it's not just this vague muddy the waters thing in in the book you have the primary character who was born biologically female was raised as a male child by a group of, I guess I would call them warrior monks. At least that mm. is kind of the trope that they're running with in the book. And yep. this, so this this character grows up believing uh, themselves to be male, finds out that they are biologically female and that this you know swap has happened. Mm-hmm. And for the remainder of the book, uh, this character is sort of grappling with how do I identify myself? I think that's one of the most pleasurable aspects of the book, actually. It's a really believable Mm -hmm. questioning of identity that happens Mm -hmm. over the course of the book and is left somewhat unresolved, but 
Again, pleasurably so. Yes. And yet, while this is happening, that character is having a romantic relationship with a identifying as female character. Mm -hmm. So there are times in the book where this is very clearly queer, and there are times in the book where this could maybe it's sort of straight. Who knows? Maybe it's just in that <laughs> weird zone. So yeah. um, a great book has a great conversation about someone who's trying to figure out who they are, um, and how they relate to other people romantically, sexually, just relationally in general. Um, mm -hmm. Highly recommend it. Go for it. Yeah. Find it. Totally. It's a yeah. break. You'll love it. Right. <laughs> yes. And that idea that science fiction and fantasy kind of have these unique tools to explore what can happen when a character, say, transitions between genders, transitions between sexual identities. I have two feelings about that. On the one hand, thankfully, it feels like uh, we're getting to a place, we haven't gotten there yet, but we're getting to a place where gender transition, where being a trans person at all, um, no matter what the transition might be, is more socially acceptable, at <laughs> least in some places, that some mm. people who are trans in whatever ways feel more comfortable being themselves, don't feel like they have to hide it. With that said, it feels kind of marginalizing to say that science fiction and fantasy are good genres to allow trans characters to exist, to allow transitions between gender and possibly sex and possibly sexual orientation and attraction, because it makes trans people themselves seem kind of fantastical and or otherworldly, which is not what I mean to say when I'm saying that, but rather science fiction and fantasy give really awesome pathways to uh, freeing characters and freeing authors who want to explore things that maybe are difficult to explore in the real world or provide mechanisms to explore them. Um, and I'm thinking back here all the way to, say, Ursula Le Guin and... Left Hand of Darkness. The Left Hand of Darkness, thank you. Um, where you have uh, species that naturally t transitions between genders over the course of their life. I'm also thinking recently, I've been rereading the books of Becky Chambers to prepare for reading her third book. Um, and in the second book, A Closed and Common Orbit, we get more information about one of the alien species. I pronounce it Aeolon. I'm not sure That's how That's how other it's people pronounced say in it. the audiobook version. Is it? Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, but you get the introduction of a gender for the Aeolon, which is kind of not a gender at all because it transitions between genders in that case. Uh, or in the case of that species, gender is based kind of on the social... I don't want to say responsibility, but the social acknowledgement that some members of the species carry eggs at some point, and some species fertilize them, and some species transition between those roles. Um, but you get basically species or members of that species who can be different genders at different times, like in The Left Hand of Darkness. So this is a really, <laughs> really long-winded way to say that that's all kind of interesting from a science fictional perspective, but when you get characters actually being though you know when you get characters in the moment, who enact yeah. those in yeah. the moment then it gets into some really potentially gay territory even Good more thing. than that really queer territory yeah. so we're covering a lot of ground here with respect to the gays but there's a lot of overlap uh with that queer podcast there's a lot of overlap with our future trans podcast or future potential bisexual podcast there's just a lot of overlap and we love that because we love the lgbtq umbrella um, we do and so there's so much more to explore and there's always, always more, which is great. Right. And I would also point out that I find the transitional genders in science fiction and fantasy really interesting, but separate from this sort of genderless or sexually free, like in, or sexually ambiguous mm. uh, future that often happens in science fiction and fantasy. And we'll get into some of those later in this podcast as well. But there yes. is this separate category of books and many of them remain written by white straight middle-aged men, which is problematic, mm -hmm. in which the future is like um, conducive to all kinds of sexual experimentation and mm -hmm. everyone's sleeping with everyone and everybody's like non-gendered or gender fluid. And that's mm -hmm. interesting too, but that takes a completely different track from like that, that kind of makes it difficult to look at specifically gay or lesbian relationships because these right. characters are all in a liminal space together. So again, that's not really what we're going to focus on, but that might intrude a little bit into our conversation and, as you said, muddy the waters. 
Right. Totally. All right. So now that we've now that we've got those ten minutes taken care of, and you know what we're talking about, <laughs> let's talk about maybe some trends in the large category that is gays in science fiction and fantasy. Um, yeah. What sorts of things have we seen, and what sorts of things are we seeing now? Oh, that's a good question. And actually, it takes me to another point in our show notes where we were going to talk about the barrier gaze trope. I think that this is an important place to start because this is a trend which used to be kind of the rule. Uh, And now we're starting to branch away from it, and that's really good. Um, Very good. it's It's still somewhat of a thing in science fiction and fantasy, and we can head straight to one of our favorite shows, actually, from last year, Star Trek Discovery, and talking about that. Yeah. So, for those who haven't watched the show, again, um, alert, alert, there's a spoiler coming. Um, there you have the first real unabashed, um, unambiguous representation of a any kind of queer couple mm-hmm. in, in yes. mainstream Star Trek canon. There's, there's hints at it throughout other Star Trek um, story arcs or whatever you call yeah. them franchises they're almost franchises yeah right yeah so there's there's hints at it but then in star trek discovery we have a gay couple who's committed to each other they're on screen they occupy significant screen time and it's a major part of the show's arc that one of those characters die and the other be irrevocably damaged and the other character's arc be more or less defined by the death of his mm-hmm. um, gay partners. So that is yes. something that when it happened on TV, there was an immediate outcry and uproar. I think yeah. the showrunners heard it. There were a lot of really <laughs> interesting uh, conversations that sprouted up um, around it. And I hope... <laughs> hope that they learn their lesson yeah. and that this is not going to be so. a thing in future seasons. Um, it is also a hope of mine that by the end of season two, there at least be hints at the remaining character having like a happy, um, healthy future ahead of him as a gay man. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that that's kind of like where I would like to start. This is something that is still relevant. It's something we mm-hmm. still see show up in television and in books, but it used to be the rule. And now it's mm-hmm. starting to be less so. And I was wondering if you mm-hmm. wanted, if you had some thoughts on that as well. Well, my first thought is that I'm tired of it. In Discovery in particular, it was so refreshing after having literally decades of Star Trek um, and promises since the 80s that there would be gay characters, that they would handle gay topics, um, that gay writers wouldn't be forced out. All of this is in reference to um, First on the Next Generation, how the writer David Gerald wanted to write and got greenlit, I think for the first or second season, an episode that directly took on an allegory of the AIDS crisis um, and featured gay crew members and then that got nixed by the studio. And then in Voyager, uh, Deep Space Nine played a little fast and loose with the trill. Um, On Voyager, there was maybe supposed to be a gay character and that came to nothing. On Enterprise, originally, actually, I forget if this was, if this was hearsay or if it was speculation or if it was confirmed by anyone, but one of the major characters was actually supposed to be gay. And then that was nixed and never went anywhere. So we were waiting a long time. And by we, I mean fans of Star Trek um, for the characters we got on Discovery. And then to see not only really healthy relationship being built, which is also something that Star Trek has struggled with in the past, and to see that relationship destroyed and one of the characters, and not only one of the characters, but a gay man of color straight up Mm -hmm. murdered on screen was really disturbing. And really, like, it was also problematic for me because they shoved it in there for dramatic effect, and it didn't feel like it was necessary to the overall plot of the series. Right. So it was like, you killed this person, this character that was really important to several communities, and you did it for no good purpose. Not that I really think that there is a good reason to kill your only gay, like, one of two. Like, that is a mortality (laughs) rate of 50% of the gay characters on this show. Right. Uh, um, In all of Star Trek. (laughs) In all of Star Trek. So, like, that's not acceptable in any case, but it was also really wasted for me. It didn't feel important emotionally to the the major arc of the plot. Just to the one character's emotional development, which is like, hmm. Right. Well, well, the reason that I feel like I'm harping on this, and I don't want to speak for you as well, but the the reason why I'm harping on this is that this is such a recent example. So recent. This is a trend that's been going on for a really long time, and 
the frustrating thing that comes with looking at gay characters in science fiction and fantasy is you think that you've made it up to a point at which this bad thing or that bad thing or this awful trope or this terrible stereotype no longer happens and then something like this happens like star trek takes a massive step forward by showing not just a gay not just coded but, but a like, gay relationship yeah. like yeah. and a gay man of color and characters who are like occupying really important roles on the ship and all these important things and then immediately falls back into, into the barrier gaze trope and yes. that is so frustrating and exhausting like we should be past this by now and, and do you think that maybe this is a problem that's still more prevalent in film and television than in books because I know that there's there's such a vast proliferation of beautifully nuanced books that we've been reading over the last couple of years. Um, but when I look at the list of shows and movies that we put together for this podcast and I look at queer representation on there, I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's at least like 50% of what's on the list has barrier gay tropes built yeah. in or at least like yeah. severely traumatize your gays, as is the case with Handmaid's Tale. Yes, right, right. Or they kind of code it so that they don't have to deal with it on the show. They'll code someone queer and then right. leave it till after the show's ended, as, it, as is the case with both The Legend uh, of Korra yes. and with Harry Potter. Leave it yes. till after the books or show is ended yeah. before actually revealing, hey, yeah, he totally was yeah. gay. And it's like, well, thanks. You didn't show us anything. But right. like, Battlestar Galactica right. had several queer characters. I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure most, if not all of them, die. Mm -hmm. And then you have... Um, movies like um, Jurassic World 2, which theoretically had a, uh, a lesbian on there. Lesbian, bisexual, we don't actually know. But they had a character with same-sex attraction on the movie, and they cut that scene so that it was coded rather than explicit because, mm -hmm. well, they say time limits. I say yeah. whatever, <laughs> ratings or audience <laughs> approval or something was up later. Right. Yeah, totally. So you bring up two things that I really, really want to talk about in relation to barrier gaze. Yeah. They're both tropes. They're both things that we still have to contend with. I think that you're right, though, to answer your question that um, barrier gaze and these other tropes are more prevalent in TV shows and movies than in books. In part, I think that's simply because books are, by virtue of there being so many different presses out there, and because... Uh, the presses that tend to put out comics or novellas or novels or story collections that are, are by gay authors or that feature gay characters, um, they tend to be smaller presses, if only by virtue of, you know, mostly doing science fiction and fantasy, but, um, you know, th they don't have the same kind of, I don't know, well of lies to fall back <laughs> on that, like, major studios do, like, you know, this isn't going to test well, or, like, this is what our audiences want to see, or, like, whatever the fuck, like, Small presses understand that, like, they have small readerships. That's kind of, like, why they exist. But anyway, so I'm going in a different direction there, and I want to return to those other two Bury your gaze first. and queer baiting. Um, let's talk about it. Bury your gaze and queer baiting. So let's go to queer baiting. Um, and I want to go to queer baiting with what is possibly the the worst offender <laughs> in the television queer history. The queer baitiest of the queer baitings. Xena, Warrior ah. Princess. So yes. take take me take me back to Zena. okay. So this <laughs> this show predates me by a ways. Like I remember it airing when I was a kid, but I wasn't allowed to watch it because it was fantasy and that wasn't on the table for me when I was a kid. However, I heard about it and being raised as I was in a somewhat conservative Christian family, it was just, it was told to me that it was a very sinful show, which of course made me very interested. <laughs> so yes, Xena and I think it was like Beastmaster were like airing around the same time on Australian Hercules. Hercules. <laughs> there you go. It was probably her well, was it Hercules? I don't know. I, I think it was reruns of Xena by that point, actually. Because um, oh, okay, Xena cool. had been, you know, Xena had quite a run. So there, there were yeah, all of these yeah. shows that were kind of like the lone individual or the team of individuals um, in a sort of I don't know what you would call it, like a pre-developed civilization world. <laughs> You, you sure. know, like, yeah, yeah. like... Yeah, I, I know what you mean, yeah. Yeah, pre-industrial yeah. revolution worlds. And, and they're, like, striving to get by. There's usually some sort of magic or whatever involved. And they, mm -hmm. they all featured, like, muscle-bound characters doing muscle-bound mm -hmm. things. Xena was different because, I mean, she was muscled, but she was also, for most of the series, paired up with... What was the character's name? Do you remember? 
Gabrielle. Gabrielle. And so Zena yeah. and Gabrielle went on all of these adventures together. And while it was clearly coded queer from fairly early mm -hmm. on in their relationship, um, Gabrielle did various things to keep the male watchership happy. So Gabrielle yeah. dated and or possibly slept with various men throughout the course of the show. And she also mm -hmm. briefly marries a man in the course of the show. And having those moments in there made it possible for you know, a television show at a much more conservative point in our Hollywood mm. history to kind of fly mm. under the radar and get shown on mainstream television. That said, mm. it also was perhaps one of the first and most clearly queer baiting of all shows in that everyone yeah. who was making it was like, yeah, this is a thing, but we can't make it too obviously a thing or right. else we get shut down. Yeah. And what that meant is right. that this was a show that became iconic in queer culture. It's mm -hmm. still like a tumblered <laughs> the you know, it's just tumblered all the time. And yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm not I'm not over exaggerating here. It is on so many tumblers all the time. It, it, it's it's everywhere. It's kind of become a code within the queer community for talking about things. It's become visual yeah. shorthand for things. And yet, the producers were never able to come out and state that Zena and Gabrielle were gay for each other. And they were never able to really, really show that in the show. Um, right. So, yeah. And there are a lot of people now who are calling for, like, a Xena reboot or whatever so mm -hmm. that we can get it to be explicitly gay. Yeah. So, so that's kind of the history, at least what I understand the history to be of Xena. Yeah. And I don't know if you have anything to add to that, but it's it's frustrating because it's one of the one of those shows which is very important to the queer community. Um right. we wanted it to be better. It couldn't be better because of the cultural moment and possibly some failures on the part of the, you know, producer. Right. And I think that a, an important uh sort of side stream to that particular trope, the queer baiting trope, um is confirming after the fact. Yeah that characters are gay. Dumbledore. And you mentioned right, you mentioned Dumbledore, you mentioned Cora from The Legend of Cora, and in both those cases, uh, you know, well in the latter case, I wonder if the creator's hands were tied because of the network, because Nickelodeon like put its foot down and were like, We're not having the gays on a children's TV show. And if uh, so, you know, that's something that the creators just Screw you, completely... Sesame Street is already there. Why aren't you? Yeah, right, right, right. Um so I don't we can lament the ridiculous expectations that studios and get angry people companies, get very angry have for audiences like the ideal audience I have air quotes mm. here um, but you know as soon as the show was over as soon as Cora moved from a TV show to a comic franchise Cora and Asami were together and unapologetically together there the other characters were coming to terms with their relationship. And I don't mean the fact that they had a relationship with each other, but it was treated more or less in the same way that the other new romantic relationships in the series when it had been on television were treated. So in that case, I think that the the creators had that idea and had their hands tied by some in you know something that they couldn't control. Yeah. Um, I, and I'm but, prepared to give them the benefit of the doubt because everybody yeah. seems to love the creators of both the Last Airbender series and yeah. Legend of Korra series. You yeah. know, they seem to be people who want to do the right thing and have their hands tied. I want to give them the benefit right. of the doubt in part because so many other creators very clearly, clearly are d doing things for the wrong reason. Right. Yeah. We need something um, good in our lives. So, <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk Dumbledore yeah. then. Because... This is one of those things where I completely reject all of the explanations that have been offered. Um, for example, that Dumbles, Dumb, blah, blah, the Dumbledore's sexual orientation didn't fit into the series, that there was nowhere to remark upon it, like that, you know, J.K. Rowling was like surprised that people didn't figure out that Dumbledore was gay. I like J.K. Rowling. I don't mean to like take her to she task. She owns a castle this, with the moat. Like, like, what's not to love? Yeah. <laughs> well, right. Right. But given the impact that Harry Potter clearly had in its publishing life, like between book one and book seven being released, it was clear that Harry Potter was a worldwide phenomenon. The the great, great service that could have been done to all the gay readership by, you know, just including a line somewhere that Dumbledore was gay, and not that that's all that I would have wanted. I would have wanted more, but some sort of confirmation that, like, this really, really important character in this franchise was gay would have been so nice to see in the actual goddamn franchise. It would have been incredible, um, in part because 
if you're really trying to appeal to unreached audiences, there's no way you're going to get the evangelical Christians anyway because they think wizards equal Satan. So, right. like, yeah. I remember not being allowed to read Harry Potter as a kid because yeah. it was... Right. You know, there were wizards, there's magic, magic is evil. So, like, including right. a queer or gay um, character yeah. in the Harry Potter universe it wouldn't have sunk it any further in the right. the un, the major population that's not reading Harry Potter's um, opinion. You know, yeah. it just wouldn't have right. touched them anyway. Yep. So, yep. like, go ahead and do it. You're not going to win them over anyway. Yeah, totally. So, uh, this one, this queer baiting, I, I see it used a lot in response to what happens on TV, what happens in movies. Like, uh, you know, there's... Uh, from the new Star Wars trilogy, you have Finn and Poe mm. as potential mm-hmm. queer baiting. You have you've always had oh, Spock and yeah. Kirk from Star Trek as potential queer baiting. <sighs> yes. Like it's been around for a while. Yes. Like before the term even existed, there was queer baiting. And and, um, and I would also note that this is another case where like the actors involved are on board, and yeah. and yet like they are limited by what's allowed by the franchise. Yeah. So and also the yeah. fact that you know, okay, this is this I just have to get it out. Marvel. Yep. Marvel. Star Wars and Disney all being owned by the same umbrella group just seems like a terrible mm-hmm. idea for so many reasons. I mean, yeah. I like to have Leia as my Disney princess as much as anyone, but I also <laughs> I also just think like when you have one organization that gets to determine what the rules are for 80% of the popular movies coming out now, yeah. that means that you have off the cuff immediately like 80% of movies that aren't going to be able to do queer stuff which is really unfortunate like you have to code it and i think that queer baiting gives rise i think you can connect the dots very clearly between queer baiting and slash fan fiction oh yeah totally um and one of the points that i made in our show notes is that you know the fact that slash fan fiction exists I think can be used as an excuse to then not include gay characters because there's already a place for them and it's outside of canon um to the extent that writers the creators that studio executives even think of such things like there's such a, a robust fan fiction community and i you know i went all the way back to kirk and spock and the slash pairings that came about in the late 60s and 70s from mm. you know fans of the original star trek been around it's that. been around for a while <laughs> yeah right it would have been really fascinating yeah. to see when that was actually happening but it's just been such a large part of such an incredibly diverse fan fiction community that um, it, it, this sort of feels like I'm taking a backhanded swipe at fan fiction, and I'm totally not. Um, but well, we might not I think have that... had, we did not have the, the cultural empowerment or status for a long time to ask for better things right. out of our media. Right, totally. So, like, it yes. makes sense in that context for us to find a second home on the internet doing fan fiction. Absolutely. Um, I think yes. that we can have our fan fiction and our representation in film and television yes. and books now, too. Yes. And yet, yeah. I think we need to ask for it. I don't think it's going to be given to us. Um, so that's a yeah. critical component that some people are totally on board with and some people really haven't gotten there yet. So if you're listening right. to this and you haven't considered right. asking for more queers in your media, your favorite media, um, take this as your permission to do so. Yeah, agreed. Um, so, okay, so we spent a lot of time talking about kind of the shitty things that Indeed. are still there in gay representations in science fiction and fantasy. Let's talk about some good right. things. Let's talk about some of our favorite books, our co- comics, TV shows, movies, whatever, le- and, and what they're doing. Yeah. Like, why are some of the good things so good? How have we gotten there? Because mm, they're gay. That's what makes them gay. <laughs> um, I mean, that's part of it, really. I mean, I, I am definitely part of a very minority um, market group that is specifically drawn to things because they do have queer representation. There's going to be other Mm -hmm, readers mm -hmm. who are just um, excited to see it there when they stumble across it. But I will hunt down books because they have queer representation. And some of the books on our list that we're going to talk about um, are the product of that search. So they might be unknowns to some of our listeners, which is pretty exciting. So, um, I mean, there's some that we've talked about a lot on this podcast, right? Um, We've got Sarah Gailey's River of Teeth and Taste of Marrow. Which we oh, love so much. Oh my god! By the way, oh, yes, yeah. um, and and you had a couple on your list that we've talked about on this podcast before as well. Yeah, um, so let's go back even a little bit because most of the books we're going to talk about, certainly all of the TV shows and the movies, are from the last decade, maybe the last couple of decades, but they're very recent. Um, some of the books go back further. Indeed. I want to talk specifically about Jim Grimsley's Kirith Kirin. Mm-hmm. And Joe Haldeman's The Forever War. So, I command you. They're even... Oh, thank you. Oh, I will. Yes, 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 indeed. I'm saluting right now. You cannot see me, but I am. Get to work. It's 
Yes, good. Um, so Kirith Kirin, 90s, gays in high fantasy. That's kind of held up. If you do a search for, like, gay characters in fantasy, uh, gay characters in science fiction and fantasy, Kirith Kirin is probably going to be one of the book that, no matter what the list you're looking at is, is the thing that will come mm. up. Because it was kind of a, a black sheep when it was released. Uh, it continues to be something that's relatively hard to find in hard copy. I want to say not a lot of libraries I have can't it, although find I'm it. using yeah. the example of like, Our Montana my library don't have and your it. library. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have never seen it at a used bookstore, but with that said, if you look for it on Amazon, you can find a used copy for like three bucks or something. So maybe common in some other used bookstores. It, you know, it's basically the high fantasy plot structure to a T, except that instead of falling in love, you know, a prince and a princess or a warrior and a princess or a prince and a warrior woman or something like you have two men who fall in love. And that's the, you know, that's the romantic uh, relationship that drives the novel forward. Um, So if you're a fan of high fantasy, definitely check that out. If you haven't checked it out before, it was really, it was a landmark uh, when it came out and it continues to be kind of, there hasn't been a real successor yet. I don't think. But if we go back even further to the 70s, I want to talk about the Forever War. Not necessarily because it stands as a pinnacle of representation, but because I think it was one of the first books that really kind of took major representation of having gays and lesbians in a work of science fiction or fantasy seriously. Mm. Um, And what Joe Haldeman did in the Forever War, and here again, there be spoilers, it It also treats relativity very seriously. So you have massive time jumps of hundreds of thousands of years for the main characters who are aging, you know, at a normal rate, but they get to see the millennia of history going by. Exactly, exactly. Um, And by the end of the book, what ends up happening is via a whole chain of consequences and events and et cetera, et cetera, I will not spoil, but uh, you end up with an entire population that is gay. Um, people who are, you know, no longer, they no longer have different sex attraction. Um, and that's kind of where humanity ends up for one reason and another. I am so excited and, to read this book. <laughs> right. It's actually, if you haven't read The Forever War, you know, apart from that, I think it's a fantastic book that has aged pretty well. Um, that aspect has, you know, not aged so super well. And, but still, the idea that you kind of have this gay utopia and it's buried in this seminal work of military science fiction, I, that still just, like, blows my That's mind, That's amazing, honestly. yeah. And, and I have a copy checked out imagine. from my library, so this is going to be... I'm going to eat this up. It's going to be good. Yeah, totally. And, and you know, I, I would love... I would love to know what that was like in the 70s when that book came out, like, how it was received, how it managed to overcome whatever stereotypes and prejudices existed against it to become one of the seminal works You're really talking about, like, the birth of the um, queer civil rights movement in the 70s happening at the same time. Yeah, totally. I mean, and on the one hand, it was really charged with optimism, and on the other hand, it was really, really um, deeply wound up with the AIDS crisis that happened Mm -hmm. shortly thereafter. So that's super interesting to me that this would be a text that was born at that time. Yes, right. And you know, interestingly, isn't really followed up on, again, by a major work in science fiction that was remembered as a major work in science fiction. Um, I I think that's an important distinction to draw because there are certainly books that were playing around with gays and lesbians and even bisexuals at at that point, Um, but The Forever War kind of remains one of those books that became the canon in spite of that, in spite of having, you know, strong representation for the 70s. Yeah. You, before I went off on that that uh, quick uh, tour of history, uh, you had mentioned the novellas River of Teeth and Taste of Marrow by Sarah Gale. I Gale. did. And one of the loveliest, loveliest, loveliest things about those books is that they present gay characters and characters who may be trans, who don't have any particular pronouns, who go by they pronouns, um, who are bisexual... All of these characters are presented without fanfare, mm-hmm. without remark. It is an alternate history, but it's an alternate history that manages to completely sidestep that, you know, these things were not a part of our actual history, but because things changed, here we are. We can have them. The things that Sarah Gailey's interested in exploring in these books are not necessarily 
justifying why these characters have a right to exist. And I love that. And I that. think that that's one of the and new directions kind of, in the genre right now. That's really, yes, really, totally. really interesting yes, to watch yes. unfold. Yes. Yes. And that, you know, it, it's more of an important component of those novellas. Um, but absolutely, I think it's on the up and up in science fiction and fantasy. I would also point to Theodora Goss's recent book, European Travel for the Monstrous Gentlewoman, which is really exploiting that kind of uh, reinvigoration of Jekyll and Hyde and Holmes and Van Helsing and all of those other uh, more historical characters. And like Sarah Gailey, Theodora Goss uh, just allows some um, lesbian vampires to be a part of the party. And again, it's not really remarked upon. You know, some of the characters kind of see that relationship and say, huh, well, that's not really that common, but we roll with it. And e even that is something you don't get in Sarah Gailey's work, but that sort of representation that is you know, treated as commonplace as the author, by the author. Commonplace. And therefore, the reader is given, you know, the author kind of presents the cue to the reader to say, yes, this is unremarkable. And by unremarkable and commonplace, I don't mean that they're, like, those are very neutral, almost negative things to say. And what I mean, rather, is that this sort of re representation is, co is, is becoming so, oh, fuck, I'm like... Talking myself around in a circle. I, can, can I summarize what I think you're trying to say? I, yes, I think please, what you're please, trying to yeah. say is, and I think that this experiment is drawn to its extreme uh, conclusion in books like Ancillary Justice by Anne Leckie and Cameron Hurley's uh, Stars Are Legion, where you have you have extreme mm -hmm. cases of like genders being different or weird. And yet, mm -hmm, that is mm -hmm. the new baseline. So they have created a new baseline mm -hmm. against yes, which, yes. you know, that's it's yes. not the main point of the story. But by presenting that representation and then just saying, this is the baseline, here also is our story happening at the same time with this new baseline. Then you have the possibility for all yes. kinds of adventures where gender isn't the main point. Sexuality, sexual orientation right. is not the main point, but it's there, it's represented, mm -hmm. it provides some sort of important component to the universe, but it's not the main engine of the story itself. And I think that that's really interesting. Yes. And, and it provides all kinds of new possibilities yeah, which totally. weren't there before and which definitely aren't there if we feel like we're tethered to historical, and I'm doing huge air quotes here because we know that history is, you know, not accurately recorded all <laughs> these things, but like historically accurate uh, right. representations of real history. So, yeah, that'd yes. be my summary. Yes. Um, but on the other hand, oh, thank you. Sorry. Uh, totally many thanks for that summary. You said exactly what I was trying to say, so, and much better than I was saying it, definitely. <laughs> but, on the other hand, as much as I love, uh, this new baseline, and the fact that authors like Sarah Gailey, like Theodore Goss, are respecting that new baseline, and you know, establishing even more so than respecting, because without their works, we really wouldn't have it, um, I feel like the works that are also exploring the difficulties that gay people still have in oh, science fiction I don't even know where you're headed and through science fiction and yeah. fantasy are so important to have. Um, and I want to go to a pair of works, one that came out last year, one that is actually a couple of decades old, um, but both of which cover uh, or explore the experiences of Chinese men who are gay. Um, the newer work is An Excess Male by Maggie Shen King, the older work is China Mountain Zhang by Maureen F. McHugh. Both really good books. I would recommend both of them. Um, but both really try and tackle uh, this idea of what it means to be kind of an intersectional gay in a science fictional future. Mm -hmm. uh, of those two books, I would say that An Excess Male really takes that particular question head on and looks at, you know, in the near future of China specifically, what does it mean to say a couple of generations after the one family per child policy? Mm -hmm. There's totally a name for this policy. And I'm not one child policy. Um, yeah, the one child policy. Um, what does that mean if you are uh, an eligible man who kind of like air quotes selects yourself out of the breeding pool because you're gay? Mm. Um, how does you know? How do you live in that science fictional future, mm -hmm. uh, almost dystopian future, uh, but not quite? And that's you know, again, we can go back to dystopias, but but um, works that sort of works that confront head on 
what it means to be gay in different science fictional or fantastical universes are really helpful for helping us as readers and us, us as writers explore what it means to be gay in this universe Indeed. which is you know increasingly science fictional um, <laughs> and how to and how to navigate that universe as well and i would say that there there have been books which have done this in the past but i had trouble finding them maybe because they were considered for a long time something that you market to a niche audience you know the yeah. word wasn't getting out there but i found something magical happened when cl polk's witchmark came out this year Witchmark mm -hmm. by yes. itself is a fantastic and in many ways intersectional work. I highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. um, one of my biggest surprises of the year. And when it started to make waves, all of a sudden, Tor.com, various other websites were releasing lists of like, if you liked Witchmark, you might also like dot, dot, dot. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. I found on that list two books which now are high on my list of favorites as far as like queer science fiction goes queer science fiction and fantasy, I should say, because these are not strictly science fictional. Uh, one mm -hmm. of those was The Watchmaker of Filigree Street by Natasha Pulley, which is relatively recent, and I believe we're getting a sequel next year, which I'm pretty excited <gasps> Ooh, about. Exciting. And The Watchmaker yes. of Filigree Street is also in very intersectional and deals with characters of color in um, yeah. same-sex relationships, which I find really interesting. And also, mm -hmm. like, how does that interact? Like, when you have um, someone who is a person of color in a same-sex relationship with someone who is not. Um, so the conversation yeah. about privilege and all of that good stuff. Uh, then mm -hmm. also on that list, or on the list that I'm remembering, which was the Torah list it was Ellen Kushner's mm -hmm. Swords Point and this is mm -hmm. one that I've never even heard of I was very obviously living under a rock when it first came out in <laughs> 2003 I'm very glad not to be living under that rock anymore because it's a fantastic book it's what they call like flint punk like flintlock rifle <laughs> punk in that there's elements of steampunk to it um, but it's not <laughs> explicitly doing anything science fictional it has elements of the mm -hmm. fantastical to it but it's it's mostly just like an excuse to have characters in absurd costumes doing feudalish things. <laughs> you know, like there's a lot of fantasy yes. out there which exists for that reason. Only in this case, yes. Kushner used that to give her permission to have this specific relationship blossom and develop. And mm -hmm. it's beautiful. And so th these texts that I discovered because of Witchmark, um, I'm really, really excited to learn that they were just, they were there all along. I just didn't know about them. So hopefully our podcast does a little bit of that work for some of our listeners in like mm -hmm. exhuming some of these forgotten texts and introducing people to new queer texts that explore gay relationships. So, yes. um, but, but another one I definitely don't want to pass over is Ian McDonald's Time Was, which is a new uh -huh. novella which came out this year. And I think what's pleasurable about Time Was is it shows Ian McDonald's evolution. Like we've been reading his mm -hmm. Luna series as it's been coming out and it's fantastic and it's very queer. But Time Was is specifically and explicitly about a gay couple um, with the intervention or intrusion of like time jumps happening in their relationship. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and so you see here in 2018, you have Time Was very explicitly about gay men. A um, couple years back, you started to have the Luna series, which was exploring gay concepts and queer concepts. Before that, Ian McDonald, you know, you can see <laughs> he got progressively more interested in this conversation as time went on. So I like mm -hmm. to look at him and his body of work as an example of doing it right, of figuring out something that's interesting, that's made possible by science fiction, and interrogating the mm -hmm. heck out of it and getting more, yeah. more exaggerated in the um, intensity of uh, or or the um, experiment and exploring it to yes. its fullest. So I definitely recommend reading his earlier works for sure, but his later works, his most recent stuff, is very very good. <laughs> yes, yes, and I would add to that actually that novellas in general are an excellent place to go to if you're looking for gay characters um, because this is just my theory, but. <laughs> Movies and TV shows have to contend with all of this back history, all of this, you know, interference from studio executives, from people who, you know, from massive conglomerates like the Marvel, Disney, Star Wars, Lucasfilm, whatever, you know, all, all of that oversight. Even novels are, you know, dealing with, well, specifically in science fiction and fantasy, traditionally written by middle-aged white guys, like you said, maybe who were engineers or scientists in their own right, you know, going back a few decades and 
we really had to have feminism come in and you know like the works of Joanna Russ the female man was incredibly mm-hmm. important the works of Ursula K. Le Guin when they were coming out they were incredibly important and remain so um, and you know it's really that gay writers um, gay characters have to push back against this history but the unique place that the paperbound novella exists in now it's kind of a new form it's not like you know novellas are reinventing the wheel or anything but for a long time in science fiction and fantasy from all, most of the big presses you didn't see paper band novellas novels had to be you know a certain minimum length otherwise it wasn't going to get printed it could be online it could be in an anthology or something but you didn't get just standalone paper bound you novellas. might get them in asimovs um, or something like that but they were always bound right. with other things if they were ever released exactly. in paper copy at all exactly yeah exactly so here's our here's our plug for tor who we're not associated with really in any way but tor <laughs> not that really we mind i mean if you park. guys want to sponsor um, us go for it right if you if you want us please take us uh, because we read enough tor books certainly <laughs> um but but they're really uh it, it seems committed to this idea of introducing the novella as a bound form to science fiction fantasy and a lot of those those novellas are by gay authors and and or have gay characters or or queer um, like if we're going to broaden the umbrella to queer like jy yes, yang's yes, tensor series is a great example of yes. queer novellas that don't necessarily feature gay characters right totally um however if you are in the mood for a list of novellas you might want to check out all of these that i'm about to talk about have come out in the past two to three years so, so hold on your, pull your chair the fuck up <laughs> here's a list um, we already mentioned Sarah Gailey's River of mm-hmm. Teeth and Taste of Marrow. Um, you also just mentioned Time Was by Ian MacDonald. And I'll add to those Stone Mad mm. by Elizabeth Baer, mm-hmm. Passing Strange by Ellen Clagis, mm-hmm. The Wayward Children series by Shannon Amen. McGuire, which Hallelujah. currently has three entries, all of which are novellas, uh, A Taste of Honey by Kaya Shante Wilson. Mm-hmm. I swear I had one more to go here. Uh, maybe, a, maybe. I and don't. a taste um, of honey by Kaya Shantwell. And a taste of honey. <laughs> yeah. And that's not even all of them. Like you said, you can get into novellas that don't uh, ha- that may not have explicitly gay characters, but maybe doing uh, really interesting other queer things, or have queer characters, or they are themselves queering science fiction. Um, so you get a lot of delicious, delicious diversity in what the novellas are, are putting out. And I think that, honestly, part of that is that novellas are so new, you can do anything with Mm -hmm. them. And I love that one of the flags that's been planted there is the LGBTQ plus flag. Um, So novellas, if when in doubt, go to the novellas. You're probably going to, you know, you have a better chance probably of finding something gay. (laughs) I'd say at this point, because most of the novellas that are on bookstore shelves are Tor.com novellas, yeah, your chances are pretty good. Um, hopefully yeah. we'll see other publishers pick this up as a, a, you know, a possibility, a new publishing format that they're interested in pursuing. I think one of the appeals of the novella that we talked about before is that it doesn't feel like as much of a financial commitment. So like you can walk yeah, in and pick up right. a couple of novellas, get a taste and a feel for an author's style and interests without breaking the bank. And then you can get into right. their larger body of work. And, and that's a right. great place to start. Like I'd say if I'd started with Cameron Hurley's Apocalypse Next novellas, which for the most part were available through uh, Hurley's Patreon and mm-hmm. then have only now been published in, in paper copy. If I'd been introduced to them first, I think I would have been more on board with the Stars or Legion in the first place. I would have had a sense for how Cameron Hurley's voice worked, for how to sort mm-hmm. of sink into the story. Um, the Stars or Legion requires you immediately to you know, suspend your disbelief um, at the door and then dive in. And that can be an insurmountable hurdle if you're not ready for it. I'm glad I got past that. But I think novellas can prepare you for an author's body of work in a special way that we may or may not have talked about on our previous novella podcast. Right. And even if they, you know, even if they're standalone novellas, they're short. You know, you can, as much as we both loved Starless, for example, the book we started this podcast with, like you said, that book is a brick. And I totally recommend that everyone go out and read it, but maybe you don't have time to pick up a new 700-page book to, like, find out what we're talking about. But novellas are anywhere between, you know, 100 and 200 pages. They tend to be smaller, so if you have fewer words per page. So you can, you know, theoretically, if you're someone who's strapped for time and you don't want to read something big novellas are an awesome uh, solution to that problem as well 
Um, and there's, I know that we're at like 55 minutes here and counting on our podcast, so I don't want to extend it too much, but do you think we have time to talk about comics and YA briefly? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Um, however, I will be, I will be leaning on you for that discussion. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so to, to, to kind of launch our conversation about comics, a little background here. I was introduced to comics by a friend who um, had the good taste to introduce me first to a lot of queer comics. So I started, my start in comics was in a very queer space, which was actually perfect for me. But it means <laughs> that as I've gotten more into comics, I realized that most comics are not that. So my taste in comics remains somewhat limited. I will say though, that we had some recent releases, like in the last five years that have been truly incredible as representations of the queer and science fiction and fantasy, um, specifically gay relationships, since we're talking about that on this particular podcast. And and I think the most quintessential one is actually on my top list of um, comics and graphic novels for the year, which is Grace Ellis's Moonstruck. And you've read this one, right, Tony? Mm-hmm. No, I haven't, haven't read, read Moonstruck, Moonstruck yet. yet. Okay, so I have not. I get have not. thee to a comic book store. It's so good. Um, this one is it's it skews a little younger, I think, in that it deals with relationships between queer people and specifically between two women as the central you know plot line of the book um, but you also have other representation throughout there but it's all presented with this really um, sort of cutesy style and it's also like it's a playful light-hearted storyline even though there are nuggets of like real deep resonance in there you have these characters who are kind of I don't need, okay so I'm gonna say I'm gonna say a word which I should never say on a podcast. They're yeah. kind of furries, and I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to talk about them without saying mentioning that they are kind of animal-human hybrids, and so it's fantastical, um, but urban fantasy um, approach under this layer of cutesy um, artistic style. Amazing storyline, though. Highly recommend it. It's just a light afternoon's read. You also have works like Lumberjanes, which have fantastical elements and also have queer representation and um, lesbian relationship in there. However, that's not a major part of the storyline like it is in Moonstruck. In Moonstruck, it is like the main storyline. You also have works like Arclight by Brandon Graham. Um, And Arclight takes a very ancillary justice or Cameron Hurley, the Stars Are Legion approach to things in that... Yes. Everyone in this world, for the most part, is like one gender or the other. So you yes. don't have you don't have the possibility for well, you don't have a lot of the baggage that comes along with um, presenting a queer or a gay relationship against a historical background of um, binary genders. <laughs> You know, <laughs> you, you just don't right. have that issue. Um, but at the same time, it's very clearly um, geared towards um, lesbian and gay readers, which I find really interesting. And the art style is incredible. You have read that one. The art style is amazing. Yes, Arclight is just beautiful. <laughs> so is The Wicked and the Divine, which is the, the last comic I'll mention here today. If you haven't gotten into The Wicked and the Divine, it's one that's a little bit... It's a little bit touched by the barrier gaze trope, but as I was discussing with um, our friend Alyssa earlier, (laughs) there are these texts which bury their gaze, but they also bury everyone else, which is what happened with Alien Covenant, the movie as well. Like you had a gay couple and they die, but everyone else dies too. So it's not really, it's not quite the same thing as the barrier gaze trope in that characters are singled out, gay characters are singled out to be killed for you know, emotional impact. Everyone right. and everyone in this world is, is like gonna be gonna die at some point. Everyone's doomed. Everyone's doomed. And and so like there are moments where I'm like, oh I struggle with that. But the rest of the Wicked and the Divine is really, really interesting. It does present loads and loads of different queer relationships. You have um, lesbian relationships, you have um, an asexual character who has romantic attraction to a polyamorous character. You have all kinds of interesting um, representation happening there. So I highly recommend picking it up, especially if you can handle a little bit of gore. Um, and comics seem to be, especially image comics, the publishing house image comics, yeah. seem to be a safe space or a safer space for conversation. Agreed. Like that. Yeah, I was going to say, the same way that Tor has really been killing it with the novellas and the gay and queer representation, Image Comics, I would say, is the place to go if you're looking for comics that are more likely to have gay characters, are more likely to have some sort of queer representation. Right, which isn't to say that it doesn't crop up elsewhere. You had 
Oh, uh, you had, I think, oh, Alyssa was telling me Batgirl perhaps was in a queer relationship. I'm forgetting if that's accurate or not. Um, <laughs> but there was also, there's there's a lot more in the Wonder Woman comics now in, in which like the relationships back on the island were obviously lesbian relationships because there were no men there. And yet there were people right. in love with each other. So <laughs> that's obviously, um, you know, very, very gay. Um, and and right. we had coding that translated into the movie Wonder Woman, which was interesting. Um, so there is some of this conversation that's starting to emerge in mainstream comic houses like Marvel and DC, but it's still not the rule. Whereas in image comics, like really, um, given that creators have a lot more freedom under image comics, you see a lot more of that. And, um, so I would point you in that direction if you're interested in looking at or looking for more queer representation in comics. There's also, and we're going to talk very, very briefly at the end about anthologies, there is a queer comic anthology that we'll talk about when we get there. But as far as YA, Tony, you've read all of, I think, maybe even more YA than I have this year. Do you have any comments on queer representation and gay relationships in YA? Well, you pulled out uh, The Bells by Danielle Clayton, um, which I would like to say, <laughs> I'm going to say that very slowly, which I would like to recognize as not only one of my favorite YA novels of the year, but also something that is really exciting um, because it's offering you gay relationships among women of color mm -hmm. in its particular fictional universe. The fictional universe, I like, I think I've in previous episodes talked about how much I really love The Bells and how it's doing things that I've never seen before mm -hmm. with the way it builds its particular fantasy universe uh, and its system of magic and the way that people inhabit that universe and use the system of magic, etc., etc. Um, however, I do think, and we've talked about this in this podcast very briefly, but that sort of intersectional gayness is something that still kind of... We need to work on, yeah. And, yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so to have a work uh, in YA science fiction fantasy, moreover, that is intersectional in that you have, um, you know, LGBTQ plus women of color, um, so important that it happened in such a good book is, you know, not also something to overlook. So The Bells, strongly, strongly recommended. I would say that that is my, if you're going to read a YA book this year um, and you're looking for gay representation check out the bells yeah absolutely i i think the bells makes a great start for this very short conversation about YA gay relationships we're going to talk about today but there's there have been other books i think if you look at mackenzie lee's body of work the gentleman's guide to vice and virtue and its sequel um, which has something about petticoats in it and also tracy, yes. tracy <laughs> sorry has petticoats in it i'm pretty sure <laughs> But Tracy Banghart also released Grace and Fury this year, and that book features um, several characters who engage in queer and or gay and lesbian relationships. It seems like YA is a little bit more coy about placing those relationships at the heart of a work when they're in science fiction and fantasy. There is, yeah. there is a bunch of books coming out where they're centered in like what you might call realistic young adult fiction, like um, Simon and the Homo Sapiens Agenda, which got adapted into Love, Simon. Um, there are books yeah. like that out there, but it seems like that hasn't quite happened in science fiction and fantasy where the gay relationship is centered and is a major focus of the plot. So mm -hmm. we're still looking for some of those books to emerge in young adult fiction. And we're also aware that there may be publishing restrictions on that. I know that in my library, for example, if there is a queer relationship centered in the book, first of all, we may not buy it. And secondly, if we do, that gets qualified and classified as mature content and gets bumped mm -hmm. up to a higher reading level. So even if it was a junior fiction, right. even if like on the sentence level, it's junior fiction. If it contains a queer relationship, it's young adult or new adult fiction. Right. So we're aware that there are forces at work that complicate things with young adults. Yes. Um, but let's, totally. let's close, I think, because um, you really wanted to talk a little bit about anthologies before we closed out. I do. So bear with us for the last three minutes of this podcast. Three, Thank you for sticking two, with us so far um, as we talk about all the gays. Okay. So anthologies. We're not in a good place. I am just going to start out by saying that. If you're looking for a good anthology of um, gay science fiction and fantasy, keep looking because it doesn't exist yet. 
unfortunately, or, or rather, that is something unfortunate. Um, Nicola Griffith collected some gay science fiction and fantasy back in the late 90s and early 2000s, um, and I think that there were a couple volumes of those books. Yeah, there was a fantasy read... one and a science fiction one. Right. Okay. So we had those, and, you know, that's awesome. Great that they exist. However, we're getting on towards at least a couple of decades old now. So there's been a lot of work in that time. Uh, hopefully there would be more. Lightspeed Magazine put out a special edition edited by Shonda McGuire back in 2015, I want to say. It might have been 2014. I have seen that. You'll probably have seen it too if you if you look for such things at like used bookstores. Um, it's called Queers Destroy Science Fiction. And unfortunately, I have to tell you that science fiction remains very much intact <laughs> after that anthology um, because I was honestly a little disappointed in the current work that it chose to feature. Um, I don't nothing really like broke the mold for me that much so I don't think it did that well with queering it definitely did have gay representation so if you're looking for an anthology that has short stories that have to have um gay characters in them definitely check out that one uh but on the whole I found it kind of disappointing um a lot of the stories were either lackluster or older, um, and some of the older stories didn't really do a whole lot for me. Um, With that said, my favorite story from that anthology was one that had originally been published, I think, in the 80s, um, and it was just super weird, and I can't remember the name of it right now. But um, if you haven't checked it out yet, I would say that all of these anthologies are worth taking a look at simply to see what is out there. But the unfortunate conclusion is not much. There's not much, and a lot of the projects that do exist are the result of Kickstarters and things like that. Um, case in point Correct. would be um, a comic anthology that I'm trying to lay my hands on, but is proving impossible to do so. Um, this anthology was funded by Kickstarter. The first volume sold out really quickly. They then did another Kickstarter campaign when they released volume two, and you could get both at the same time. And then they released an Eisner award-winning collection of comics by um, comic creators of color. I think this was just last mm-hmm. year, and that ended up um, being a huge success. But all three of these comic anthologies are really hard to lay your hands on, both of the queer right. ones and then the one um, by creators of color. And the, the anthologies are titled beyond the queer sci-fi and fantasy comic anthology just simply that uh if you guys have any copies that you're willing to loan me i'm looking to lay my hands on one um (laughs) because i want to know what's in there i don't i can't even tell you what's in there because it's literally impossible to buy so um that's one of the downsides of doing a kickstarter campaign because while it's being driven by demand not everyone hears about the project while it's ongoing and the product is available. So um, what really would swing the tide is when you have something make it onto mainstream bookshelves where you have like a steady supply. So I'm still waiting for that to happen in comics, like as far as anthologies go. And, you know, someday maybe that will be our job. Maybe we will be the ones collecting and publishing anthologies. (laughs) It's the imaginaries. imaginaries. Keep keep your eyes on us because... And we're specifically interested in intersectionality. We didn't get to talk about that as much in this podcast, but maybe that's a focus for a future podcast, talking about intersectionality. I think so. Okay, we'll get there. Yeah, because it's definitely, it deserves deserves its own podcast, I would say, and maybe even a podcast specifically thinking about the intersections of uh, LGBTQ plus characters or creators. in science fiction Yeah, and we didn't really even get to interrogate that yet in this podcast, but we're way over budget. But someday we will talk about how much does the author um, impact how you receive a text. We talked about that briefly when it came to Orson Scott Card in one of our previous Mm -hmm. podcasts. However, when it comes to queering and um, examining gay relationships in science fiction and fantasy, you know, how do we engage with the fact that there are non-queer authors writing queer characters and there are queer authors writing non-queer characters? Like, let's talk about that Mm -hmm. sometime too. Yes, agreed. So this is all fodder for another Mm -hmm. day. Please let us know if you have thoughts, if you'd like to hear that uh, follow-up podcast and what you would like to hear us talk about in addition to that. And uh, how about where to find us? Oh, yeah. You all, you found us already if you're listening to this podcast, so keep finding us where you found us but our podcast (laughs) is available for download or or streaming through 
iTunes, SoundCloud, and on YouTube where we put our backlist episodes. You can also view on YouTube some of Tony's latest projects. By the time this episode goes live, at least two of his imaginary guides specifically dealing with Star Trek will be live on YouTube. Yes. And you can yes. find links to all of the above from our website, which is www.imaginaries.net. You can drop us a line at our Gmail, which is imaginarypod at gmail.com, or you can grab us on Twitter. Our handle is at imaginary underscore pod. Um, we would love to hear from you. So do. I mean, talk to us, not do. hear from us. Do it. Right, right. Talk, <laughs> talk to, to us. us, please. We love you. You're great. Yes. 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 Mm-hmm. yes. All mm-hmm. right. All right. Well, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye for this time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye now. Bye now. Bye. Bye.